Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Jeff Redley. I'm the pastor of this community of faith. I welcome you all to worship this day, and I pray that you have a meaningful worship experience while you're here. What I'm going to do is ask you to rise if you're able, and Barb will lead us in our call of worship this day. God leads the way and makes our footsteps sure. God leads the way and makes our footsteps sure. God leads the way and makes our footsteps sure. God leads the way and makes our footsteps sure. The land is fertile and rich with good rain in season. God leads the way and makes our footsteps sure. The harvest is bountiful. We dwell in the land that has prepared for us. Amen. Join me in the opening prayer. God, our guide and our protector, as we gather today in your holy house, open our minds and souls and hearts that we may be inclined to hear the gentle direction of your spirit in our lives. Help us follow you as you lead us to the land you have created for us, where we may dwell with you and in you. Amen. Good morning. I grew up attending the United Methodist Church in Ripon. So when we moved to Slinger in 1991, I looked for the closest United Methodist Church. The first Sunday that I came to visit, Victoria Trick was the first person to talk to me at coffee hour. Back then, coffee hour was coffee and maybe a package of cookies. How times have changed. Then I took our three-year-old daughter, Brenna, to Sunday school, where Bev Schatz was the teacher. I sat in on the lesson, and when I left that Sunday, it felt right. 28 years later, First United Methodist Church still feels right. You are my church family, and I care about each one of you. I can't imagine my life without you. Our children, Brenna and Mitch, grew up in this church. They participated in Sunday school, vacation Bible school, confirmation, youth group, church camp, and mission trips, and they have great memories. I am thankful that they had Christian peers to spend time with and strong Christian youth leaders who they still look up to today. Along with worshiping on Sunday, Tim and I have gotten to know you through many small groups. We have both served on various committees over the years. We've participated in Bible studies and mission trip trips, gotten to know you better through Diner's Delight, Family Camp, Women's Retreat, the Daniel Plan, Family Promise, and the Summerfield Meal Program, just to name a few. You have become like family, and we have much gratitude for the relationships that continue to grow each time we serve together. In closing, I'd like to share my stewardship story. In our early years of attending, we were inconsistent givers. We paid our bills first and then gave to church sometimes. Then one Sunday, I can't remember who said it, but they shared their advice. Pay God first and he will provide for you. 
That was a life-changing moment for me. The next Sunday, we decided to trust God, and the first check that I wrote was to church. The next week, a check came in the mail that I had been waiting for for a long time. I had a very successful rummage sale, and I found a $20 bill in my coat pocket. Coincidence? No. It was God affirming our decision. So today, we still pay God first. No matter if we're at church or not, we are sure to cover that pledge first. And God continues to provide for us. Thank you. Thank you, Carla, for sharing this day and that most important message that you're going to hear again today. Okay. <laughs> so at this time... seated. So good morning everybody. Thanks for coming up today. I got some things I want us to see today so let's take a look at our first picture for the day. It's a dollar? Okay anybody want to argue with that? It's a dollar bill? Okay. Anybody else have a different idea what that is? Okay. It's a five dollar bill. Okay. So have you, have, have you ever had the opportunity to hold a $5 bill and be smiling like that? Okay, tell me. Maybe not, huh? <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. A bigger one than that, huh? Yeah. Did that feel good? Okay. So here, I, I'm, of course you can imagine I'm going somewhere with this, so let's, let's take a look at the next thing. Okay, what did you notice about the girl in the last picture? Okay. Teeth. Yeah, it's teeth, right. Okay. So the girl that was just smiling that was holding a $5 bill, she was missing one of her teeth, wasn't she? Okay. So what happens when you lose a tooth? Okay, what happens? Oh, really? Oh. oh, the tooth fairy on camera. All right. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a nice thing to remember. You got something to add? Oh, so you get a hamster instead of that money under the pillow or whatever. Okay, let's look at the next slide here. Did, did we, oh, did we, I think I missed one, didn't I? Yeah, can you back up one? Because I didn't, uh, oh yeah, well, okay, that was the tooth under the pillow, okay. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, we have to be careful of how we look at things, and it wasn't a rock, it was a tooth, okay, so, so here, so here this, this person happened to get a five dollar bill for their tooth, you know, which, it's probably pretty generous because it's at least 20 times more than I would have been accustomed to as a kid, you know. But anyway. Okay. Okay, so, so now we got this $5 bill for our tooth from the Tooth Fairy. So what should we do with this $5 bill? Okay, tell me. Okay. Well, you can buy stuff with some of it, but I want you to say a couple other things, okay? Tell me. Well, you, you can save it. Okay, that's part of the answer. You need to save part of it, okay? And then, and then there's another part of this, too. Okay, you got an idea? A rubber ducky. A rubber ducky, yeah, okay. Well, here's, here's what I want you to think about, though. When we, when, we get, when we get some money like that, we should give part of it, we should give part of it to God. Okay, I think I'm losing you. Let's pay attention here, okay? Part of this should go to God, and part of it we should save, and then we can spend the rest on those things that we think we might need or that we desire, okay? So let's, I think we got one more. Okay, what is it? 
Does, it, does that look like the tooth fairy you saw on the camera? Okay, okay, I got one, uh, one more thing I want to show you, okay? Well, I got two more things. Yeah, okay, so, so this is the part we should save a little bit of this. We should give a little bit to God. And then here's, here's part of our lesson for today that the big people are going to see too. It tells us you should give what you decided in your heart to give because God loves a cheerful giver. So let's have a prayer, guys. Okay. Gracious God, we thank you for how you work in us and we ask that you help us to remember to always give part of what we receive back to you. That you always help us save for the future and that you be with us as we continue to grow in life. Amen. So thanks for coming up today. You can go to your, uh, your choir rehearsals now. Or thing I want to say is remember today we're going to have some new member classes so this week and next week and what I understand there's the potentially 16 people that are going to be there and we're going to hold these in the adult education room and if you're like me you like to attach numbers to stuff so W1 is that room and so it's the west wing it's the second hallway go through fellowship hall turn right and you'll find that room. It says adult education. It also says W1. And that's where we'll be after the second service, okay? So today, we also want to give you a financial update. So I'm going to... Yes, please come forward. <laughs> I, I get confused with names. I almost called him Dennis, but it's Brian, okay? <laughs> so, so <laughs> I've been called Dennis before. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Brian Swenson and I'm on the Finance Committee and given that it's our annual fall uh, stewardship drive time, there's been a number of questions about where is the church at exactly on this year's budget, so I wanted to give you an update on that. This year our offerings that we have received from all of you uh, are right around $187,000, that's through September. The amount of payments that the church has paid out is 176000 through September. So there's a positive more coming in than going out of $11,000. So that's a very good thing. Thank you all. Out of our apportionment payments this year, we've paid $8,800 $8, out of $53,000. If you'll remember back to our charge conference in January, uh, we felt we were going to be challenged to get to the total $53,000 and we committed to the conference to do 26000 So we're about uh, $16,000 short on that, but that $10,000 I talked with you about previously can be used towards that, and the board is looking at that. So um, obviously our goal is to get to 53, but we had committed to 26000 this year. On the capital improvement uh, loan that we had taken out about five years ago, there's 185000 left to be paid on that. We've got $45,000 in the bank that we've received over the, the last five years that we're holding on to from a contingency perspective. So the total amount left on that loan is $140,000 to be able to pay that off. And finally, we have really seen an upswing in giving the past couple months. Uh, it's honestly been remarkable how much the giving has gone up. Thanks to all of you for doing that. 
Um, we're going to be using that giving trend to help us project our uh, receivings or givings for the 2020 budget. And we will be meeting next Monday night to start the planning for that with the Finance Committee. So um, overall, we feel very good about where the church is at. We're seeing some very positive signs in giving recently here. And uh, we're going to be using that as momentum for next year. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, so thank you for that update, and praise God that we're doing well, okay? And so now I'm going to invite Liz and Lily forward. Are they? Oh, there they are, okay. Good morning. Um, this is Lily. This is, uh, as I tell the children, my favorite child. <laughs> she doesn't talk back. Um, that's just a joke, and they know it. But um, this is Lily, who just turned two years old on Thursday. She's a very young therapy dog. And a therapy dog's job is to love. Therapy dogs are different, <clears throat> excuse me, from service animals in that they help people when they're feeling sad or feeling times of stress. And the reason I wanted to speak with you today is that I'm involved with an organization called Warriors Journey Home, where Lily and I uh, intend to help with reintegration of military folks who are dealing with the stresses that war puts them under. And starting on, do you have something to say? She is a very young therapy dog. She's recently been certified, so all of this is new to her. So she does get a little stressed just because it's a new experience, which is why you'll see me having a treat bag. No, you normally wouldn't do that during therapy work, but this is continual training for her. Um, but with Warrior's Journey Home, starting November 1st, going through November 11th, we're going to be doing witness trees in three locations. And it's going to be in Hartford and Slinger and at the Washington County Courthouse. I'll give you the specifics about the Hartford, and if anyone wants to speak with me after service, I can give them the specifics about the others. But what a witness tree is, is we will be hanging 22 dog tags from it. And this is to raise awareness of suicide prevention in our veterans, because 22 veterans a day commit suicide. So each day between November 1st and 11th, um, sorry. I already said that. <laughs> uh, the witness tree is to help extend larger support to the veterans of our community. Even if you're a veteran who's not struggling with any problems, we would love to have you join us because you can support other veterans. In Hartford, it's going to be at Bairnd Park. I'm probably not saying that right, but it's right over by the fire station. Um, and it's going to be at 9 o'clock. Let us take those things we've spoken here and things we're holding in our hearts and be in an attitude of prayer. Oh Lord, each morning we arise wondering what the day will bring. For some of us, there are many wonderful things to anticipate, new opportunities to celebrate. We smile at the sun and revel in its warmth. As a community of faith, we come together seeking God's mercy and blessing. Even in the midst of trouble, your love comes through to us in the most amazing of ways. For our friends and family who experience great joy at this time, we offer our joyful prayers. May the warmth of your restoring and transforming love flood over them and through them to others. For many people, Pain and hurt seem to be a daily encounter with life. Hope for something better is a distant vision. Lord, be with our sisters and brothers in their pain. We ask for your healing love to surround them as they journey through life. Give them courage and peace. For all your healing mercies, we gratefully thank you, Lord. We thank you for people everywhere. We offer prayers of healing and hope that their lives may be filled with your love and your peace. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And so I invite you all to rise if you're able, and we'll sing together. are stewards of the earth. We are stewards of those things entrusted to us, inherited by us, and earned by us. We are stewards of our wealth and our possessions, and we're stewards of our physical bodies. In ancient times, stewards were trustees who cared for things and that were owned by others. Today, we don't hear much about stewards and stewardship outside of the church. It's a language that's actually derived from biblical roots and church heritage. It's at risk of becoming insider language, not easily accessible or understood by those that are new to the church. Stewardship is actually about generosity, and that's an aspect of character. It's up to all of us to be sure our children are cultivated in generosity. Generosity extends beyond just the use of money, but it definitely includes that. There are generous spirits, generous souls, people who are generous with their time and with their talent and with their treasure. An endearing childhood memory for many of us was dessert time at Grandma's. If there weren't freshly baked cookies, she'd get out the ice cream and she'd dish scoops, which she handed down the table until everyone had one. When you were about halfway done, Grandma would announce, there's more where that came from. In other words, if you wanted seconds, all you had to do was ask. 
as the disciples handed out the five loaves of bread and two fish which Jesus multiplied to feed the multitudes. Can't you just picture them saying, there's more where that came from? Jesus' generosity was not limited to that one miracle. To this day, Jesus continues to offer us abundance. In the lesson that we'll hear shortly, Paul was saying to the church in Corinth, there's more where that came from. Today we'll learn that that's what God desires from us. This whole idea of a stewardship campaign isn't anywhere in Scripture. But we're called to live out our faith consistently in every area, including our finances. I don't intend to squeeze every last dime out of you today. But I do hope that by the end of worship today, everyone can look at what giving is from a biblical perspective. When we give the way we're taught, it's like the Capital One commercial. What's in your wallet? <laughs> it protects us from the problems and the heartaches that can come our way if we hold back from God. Materialism has a way of creating struggle in our lives. Because we fail to remember that God truly desires to show or he wants us to show generosity. Our lesson today will instruct us to be scripturally generous. We will examine the proper perspective for giving, the procedure for giving, and the focus for giving. Our text comes from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. When this congregation heard about a famine that had been gripping Jerusalem, they were concerned about the Christians that were living there. They vowed to send help, and they were the first congregation to make that promise. And so let's listen now as Barb reads our lesson for today. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work, as it is written. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but it is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's not surprising to hear Paul urge the Corinthians to give generously and cheerfully, but why did Paul think that the Corinthians would want to do it anyway. How could the Corinthians be certain that by giving generously to help the Christians in Jerusalem that they wouldn't make themselves poor? Paul was certain that God was at work in their hearts and he knew that they realized that everything they had came from God. That's what would ensure the Christians had enough for themselves. In other words, there's more where that came from. Whenever we place an offering in the plate, we're simply doing what we did at dessert time in Grandma's. We're handing down that which God first entrusted to us. 
And just as we didn't have to worry about not getting any ice cream at Grandma's, we don't have to worry about having enough for ourselves because we gave an offering. There's more where that came from. What stewardship is really about is trust. We give our resources so that we may share in the work for God's good glory. God's an investor, not a beggar. In that way, God is like Grandma. When she's scooping ice cream, she doesn't do all the work herself. She lets us pass the bowls of ice cream to share in the joy of serving and delight in the words of thanks given when everyone receives their dessert. And while you're busy handing out the ice cream, you don't have to worry about whether there'll be any left for you. You trust your grandmother when she says there's more where that came from. And so, we can trust God as we pass our treasure on because there's more where that came from. A frugal man walked into his house panting and almost completely exhausted. What happened, honey, inquired his wife. Well, it's a great new idea. I had to be a better steward of our resources, he said. I, I ran all the way home from the stewardship meeting behind the bus and I saved a dollar and a half. <laughs> and his flustered wife says, well, that wasn't very bright. Why didn't you run behind a taxi and save ten dollars? What attitude should we have toward giving? Paul uses an analogy about the sower. To give is really to sow. And this is opposed to how we perceive giving. We perceive giving as losing. How many times have we given or thought about giving a certain amount and our mind starts playing tricks on us? We think that could be a car payment or that could be this week's grocery bill. That could have been what I needed to pay for those new tires or that suspension maintenance. That could have been an insurance payment. We feel that way because we gave the money in the offering thinking we've lost it and it's not coming back. That's how we tend to see giving as something that's lost. Yet scripture is clear. Giving is sowing. We know the farming terms. What happens when you sow? You reap. From one ear of corn, how many rows of corn can you plant? Each of those kernels will grow as a stalk. And how many ears of corn are on each stalk? This concept of sowing is amazing. It's not something that's lost and gone forever. It actually multiplies. That's what we're going to be taught about giving. Giving is like sowing seed. One tomato plant can grow an amazing number of tomatoes. That's like giving. We need to remember that we're sowing seeds and that the harvest is coming. This whole concept of sowing and reaping is built into the very fabric of life. Without sowing and reaping, all things will expire. Think of a hanging pot without holes. If you keep giving it water without the ability to drain the water away, the plant will become waterlogged and it will die. Any plant that isn't producing, is dying. In finance, even in a bad economy, those who invest will outperform many times over, usually those who put their money under the mattress. What's in your wallet? The New Testament gives us four guides to giving. We are to give freely, we are to give generously, we are to give regularly, and we are to give cheerfully. To give cheerfully is extremely helpful. It also helps us gauge where our faith is at. How much can we give and still be grinning? And it pushes us and causes us to consider if we can be happy giving more. Perhaps we're too entangled in material things and God is trying to untangle it. The standard meets us where we are with what we can give at any point in our life. It also challenges us to trust God. There are people who don't make promises for various reasons. One reason is, is that not all churches do it. Another reason is that some church leaders or some believe that church leaders should have faith that the finances will be there. 
But when we look at the Old Testament, God didn't tell the priests to have faith that the money would come. Everyone was challenged to tithe, and the priests knew exactly what the congregation would be giving. The priests were also challenged to tithe and were to promise the same level as everyone else. It's not scriptural for church leaders to have to blindly guess what people will be giving. Having what I like to call a faith gap highly concerns finance committees. It leaves them uncertain about expenditures that the church must make. We're all called to collectively demonstrate faith by looking within ourselves, deciding before God what we're going to give, writing it down, and then giving it. For all of us, it takes faith to do that. Verse 7 from our lesson says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Here the act of giving comes as after the decision. We are to decide first. Then we are to give. It's not haphazard or what's left over. It's not dependent on whether I'm in worship or how much money I might happen to have in my checking account this week. It's based on the commitment we make after a serious time of prayer and reflection. That's what making a promise is. A practical way of delivering out the deliberate act is to write it down. This is practical spirituality. Why is it helpful for us? Number one is that we forgive. Number two is that we are weak. If things are running behind and it looks like we don't have enough money, our hand starts to quiver when we're writing our check. If we decided ahead of time how much to give, we'll give it and we'll act in faith. There's something about writing down your promise that is more decisive and concrete. It's a real act of commitment and faith. What's in your wallet? God hands us grace every day. And grace like ice cream comes in many different flavors. God's grace, God's grace is us with money so that we can buy food and also support the work of the church. But God daily gives us the grace of forgiveness too. God daily forgives us even though we're not always cheerful about giving. God gives us the grace of forgiveness even when we give our leftovers. God forgives us when we make plans for the future if the church is an afterthought. God forgives us even when we think that stewardship is something for adults and not the youth and the children. Since there is no end to this grace, we can generously pass it on to others. Do you see what a difference that'll make when you're ready to blow up at your kids or your siblings because They've been on your nerves all day. This is how we often treat God, and yet we receive patience and we receive forgiveness. God's forgiveness has no end, so we can pass that forgiveness on to others because there's more where that came from. Yes, dessert time at Grandma's was special. That's when her love and her generosity was the clearest. It was evident from that ice cream. God, of course, is even more loving and gracious and generous than Grandma. So what is Christian giving? It's simply a challenge to look at what's in your wallet and then set it aside, allowing God to lead. We do that through prayer because we're thankful for God's blessings. Our promise is an act of spiritual worship between you and God. Think about your abundance and pray about your gift to help First United Methodist Church move forward together with Christ. We've all received the promise card and we've been invited to have them in by next Sunday. This all has to do with sowing and reaping. This is between you and God and if you give to God generously, you will reap generously. In the end, no matter What matters most is that God speaks to you and shows you that your life will be invested in one way or another. It all comes down to our time, our talents, and our treasure 
and where we will use them. These are the most important decisions we will make. Amen. Please join me in the offertory prayer. Loving God, you have given us life and freedom. Everything we have and everything that we are is a gift from you. You call us to be stewards of this gift. As caretakers of all that you have provided, we give back now. We dedicate these gifts to you. Bless these tithes and offerings. Help us to always use your gifts wisely. Lead us as we hear these things. Help our faithful stewardship. From Christ to others, we pray these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Join me in our response of sending forth this day. Let us go to be witnesses of God's love. We will tell in our neighborhood. We will live in every moment of every day. Let us go to be witnesses of Jesus' justice. We will challenge those who harass others. We will help rebuild broken lives and neighborhoods. Let us go to be witnesses of the Spirit's peace. Thank you.